This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Becky Cook. Commentaries on the Gallic War by Julius Caesar. Translated by Thomas Rice Holmes. Book 3, Chapter 17 through 29. While these events were passing in the country of the Veneti, Quintus Titurius Sabinus made his way with the troops assigned to him by Caesar into the country of the Veneli. Their leader was Viridovix, who was also commander-in-chief of all the insurgent tribes, and had raised from them an army and large irregular levies. Within the few days that followed Sabinus's arrival, the Alerci Iborovices and the Lexovii massacred their senators because they refused to sanction the war, shut their gates, and joined Viridovix and a host of desperadoes and brigands had also assembled from all parts of Gaul, to whom the hope of plunder and love of fighting were more attractive than farming and regular work. Sabinus, who occupied a position in all respects excellent, remained obstinately in camp, while Viridovix, who had encamped opposite him two miles off, led out his troops every day and offered battle. The result was that Sabinus not only incurred the contempt of the enemy, but was actually the object of some abuse from his own troops and he let the enemy become so convinced of his timidity that they presently ventured to approach close to the rampart. His motive was that he felt bound, as a subordinate, especially in the absence of his chief, to avoid engaging such a numerous enemy unless he had the best of ground or some favorable opportunity presented itself. Now that they were convinced of his timidity, he selected from his auxiliaries a quick-witted Gaul, the very man for his purpose induced him by liberal rewards and promises to go over to the enemy and explained his object the man came to them in the guise of a deserter described the terror of the romans and explained that caesar himself was hard pressed by the veneti and that sabinus would march his army stealthily out of camp not later than the following night and go to his assistance on hearing this they all cried out that the chance of striking a decisive blow was not to be lost they must attack the camp many circumstances combined to impel them to this decision the recent inaction of Sabinus, the assurances of the deserter, want of supplies, for which they had made scant provision, the hope that the Veneti would succeed in their campaign, and lastly, the fact that what men desire they are generally prone to believe. Influenced by these motives, they would not suffer Viridovix and the other leaders to leave the assembly until they had agreed to let them arm and make a dash for the camp. When they were allowed to have their way, they were as exultant as if victory were certain, and, collecting brushwood and faggots to fill up the Roman trenches, they advanced against the camp. The camp stood on rising ground, which sloped gently from its base for about a mile. The Gauls hurried up at a great pace in order to give the Romans the least possible time for falling into line and arming, and arrived breathless. Sabinus harangued his men, and gave the signal which they were eagerly awaiting. As the enemy were hampered by their loads, he ordered a sudden sortie from two of the gates. Thanks to the favorable position, the courage of the legionnaires, and the experience which they had gained in previous combats, in their own want of skill and exhaustion, the enemy instantly turned tail without standing a single charge from our men. They were in no condition to escape, and our troops, who were fresh for our pursuit, killed a great number of them. The rest were hunted down by the cavalry, who allowed few to get away. Thus Sabinus heard of the sea-fight, and Caesar of Sabinus's victory at the same time and all the tribes immediately submitted to Titerius. For, while the Gallic temperament is impetuous and warlike, their character is irresolute and has little power of bearing up against a disaster. About the same time Crassus arrived in Aquitania, which, as the narrative has shown, may be regarded in Arian population as one-third of Gaul. Knowing that he had to fight in a country where, a few years before, Roman general Lucius Valerius Preconinus had been killed and his army defeated, and from which a proconsul, Lucius Manlius, had retreated in disorder with the loss of his baggage, he saw that he would have to exercise no ordinary care. Accordingly, he provided for a supply of grain, raised auxiliaries and cavalry, and also called out individually a large number of excellent soldiers from Tolosa, Carcasso, and Narbo, states in the province adjacent to Aquitania, and marched his army into the country of the Sociates. On becoming aware of his approach, raised a large force, including cavalry, being very strong in that arm, and attacked our column on its march. The battle began with a combat of horse. Their cavalry were repulsed, and ours were pursuing them, when suddenly they unmasked their infantry, which they had stationed in ambush in a valley. The latter fell upon our disordered troops and renewed the action. 
The fighting was prolonged and fierce, for the associates relied upon their past victories, and felt that the fate of all Aquitania depended upon their courage. While our men were eager that the world should see what they could achieve under their youthful leader, without the chief and the other legions. At length the enemy, having suffered heavy loss, turned and fled. Many of them were slain, and Crassus, advancing to the chief town of the associates, at once proceeded to lay siege to it. As the garrison offered a stout resistance, he brought up sheds and towers. The garrison first attempted a sortie, then drove galleries in the direction of the terrace and sheds. The Aquitanians are very skilled in operations of this kind, as mining work exists in many parts of their country. But finding that, owing to the vigilance of our troops, they could effect nothing by these devices, they sent envoys to Crassus, asking him to accept their surrender. The request was granted, and, in obedience to his command, they laid down their arms. But all was not over. Our men were all intently watching what was going on, when Adiatunus, who was in command, attempted a sortie from another part of the town with six hundred devoted followers, whom the natives called Soldurii, men who, while life lasts, share all good things with the friends to whom they have attached themselves, on the understanding that, if any violence befall them, they are either to share their fate or to die by their own hands. And within the memory of man, no one has ever been known to shrink from death when his friend and leader was slain. With these men, Adiatunus attempted a sortie, but when the roar of battle arose from that part of the entrenchment, the soldiers ran to arms, and, after hard fighting, Adiatunus was driven back into the town. Notwithstanding, he prevailed upon Crassus to allow him to surrender on the original terms. On receiving the arms and hostages, Crassus started for the country of the Vocates and the Tyrosates, and, now learning that a fortified town of great natural strength had been captured a few days after the arrival of the besiegers, the natives were thoroughly alarmed and began to send envoys in all directions, to swear mutual fidelity, to exchange hostages, and to raise troops. Envoys were also sent to the tribes of Hither Spain, near Aquitania, with a request for reinforcements and leaders, whose arrival enabled them to undertake the campaign with great prestige and to put a large number of men in the field. The leaders chosen had served from first to last with Quintus Sertorius, and were believed to possess great military skill. Adopting Roman methods, they proceeded to select positions, to entrench their camp, and to cut off our convoys. Crassus, reflecting that his own force was too small to be readily divided, that the enemy, while scouring the country and, and blocking the roads, were able to leave a sufficient force to protect their camp, which made it difficult to bring up corn and other supplies, and that their numbers were daily increasing, thought it best to fight a decisive battle without delay. He referred the question to a council of war, and, finding that every one agreed with him, determined to fight on the morrow. At daybreak he moved out the whole force, formed them into two lines with auxiliaries in the center, and awaited the development of the enemy's plans. Although relying on their numbers, their established military reputation, and the weakness of our force, they considered it safe to fight. They nevertheless thought it safer to gain a bloodless victory by blocking the roads and cutting off our supplies, while, in case the Romans began to retreat from want of food, their idea was to attack them on the march, when their movements were impeded and they had the packs to carry and were dispirited. The plan was approved by their leaders, and accordingly when the Roman army moved out they remained shut up in camp. Crassus defined their intention. Their inaction, which produced the belief that they were cowed, had stimulated the ardor of our troops for battle and all were overheard saying that the camp ought to be attacked without further delay. So Crassus, haranguing his men, who were all in great heart, advanced rapidly against the enemy's camp. Some filled up the trenches, others drove the defenders from the rampart and fortification with volleys of missiles, and the auxiliaries, in whose soldierly qualities Crassus had not much faith, kept the combatants supplied with stones and other missiles, brought up sods for filling the trench, and thus made a decent show of fighting. The enemy, too, fought steadily and with no lack of courage, and the missiles which they threw from their commanding position did good execution. Meanwhile, some troopers rode round the enemy's camp and reported to Crassus that on the side of the rear gate it was not entrenched so carefully as elsewhere and offered easy entrance. Crassus urged his cavalry officers to stimulate their men by liberal rewards and promises, and explained his object. In obedience to orders, they marched out the cohorts which had been left to protect the camp and had had nothing to tire them, made a wide detour to avoid being observed from the enemy's camp, and, while everybody was intent upon the action and noticed nothing else, rapidly gained the part of the entrenchments which we have mentioned, demolished them, 
and made good their footing in the camp before the enemy could clearly see them or make out what was going on. And now, when our troops heard the shouting from that part of the camp, their strength returned, as generally happens when soldiers feel confident of victory, and they fought with redoubled energy. Finding themselves surrounded, the enemy in utter despair hastened to throw themselves over the entrenchments and ran for their lives. The cavalry hunted them over the broad, open plains. Out of fifty thousand who were known to have come from Aquitania in the land of Kentabari, barely a fourth escaped them, and late at night they returned to camp. On hearing the result of the battle, the bulk of the population of Aquitania, including the Tarbelli, Bajirions, Petitiani, Vocates, Torresates, Elusates, Gates, Oski, Garumni, Sibusates, and Cocosates, submitted to Crassus and voluntarily sent hostages. A few distant tribes trusted to the lateness of the season, as winter was coming on, and neglected to follow their example. About the same time Caesar led his army against the Morini and the Menapii, in the belief that the campaign could soon be finished. The summer was nearly over, but while all the rest of Gaul was tranquilized, they remained in arms, and had never sent envoys to him to sue for peace. Their tactics were quite different from those of the other Gauls. Being aware that the strongest tribes which had fought in the open field had been completely defeated, they took refuge, with all their belongings, in their continuous forests and marshes. On reaching the outskirts of the forest, Caesar proceeded to entrench his camp. No enemy had so far appeared, and the men were working in scattered groups, when suddenly the enemy rushed out from the forest from all sides and attacked them. The men quickly seized their weapons and drove them back into the forest with considerable loss, but pursuing them too far, over very difficult ground, lost a few of their own number. Caesar now proceeded to clear the forest, and continued doing so day after day. To prevent the soldiers from being attacked and flank, while they were unarmed and off their guard, he regularly laid the timber as it was felled in the direction of the enemy, and piled it as a barricade on both flanks. A large space was cleared with incredible speed in a few days, by which time the enemy's cattle and the rear portion of their baggage were in our hands, while they were making for the denser parts of the forest. But such stormy weather followed that the work had to be discontinued, and, owing to continuous rains, it was impossible to keep the soldiers longer under tents. Accordingly, after ravaging all the enemy's fields and burning their hamlets and homesteads, Caesar withdrew his troops and quartered them for the winter in the territories of the Alerci, the Lexovi, and the other tribes which had recently been in arms. End of Book 3, Chapter 17 through 29. Commentaries on the Gallic War by Julius Caesar. Translated by Thomas Rice Holmes.